Thank you so much, Michael. Hi, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege to be here. I'm very excited. I, I have not participated in the Real Truth About Health conference before. Uh, this is my first time, but I've uh, heard uh, so many good things about it and watched um, many of the snippets over the last few years. And uh, it's an honor to be in such uh, distinguished company with uh, my fellow speakers presenting to you all about uh, the real truth about health. So with that, let me go ahead and bring up my, there we go. So I, I like to use the chat box um, and I wanna kind of give it a, a, a test run. I'm gonna be talking to you about holistic health. And really, I just think of it very simply as whole person health. Um, as uh, was mentioned in the bio, I serve as the medical director of the McDougall program. And um, a lot of my appointments during the week are, are new consultations for patients uh, who I have not met before. Um, and so I wanna uh, have you all take a guess um, if you can. And in the chat box, if you could write what you think is the number one thing that I feel I provide my patients with at the end of our time together, the consultations, you know, they're scheduled for 25 minutes, but oftentimes they will go over even as long as 45 minutes. Anyone want to just put in the chat box, the number one thing you think that I believe I help provide my patients with at the end of that consultation. Uh, visit. Okay, Kelly, Kelly puts in health. Good. The, the chat box is encouragement, hope, hope, hope. Wow. You are care, respect, understanding, and love, listening to them, weight loss, peace, health and knowledge. Someone to actually listen. Benefits of plant-based diet. Plant power. Woohoo. Coaching. A different way of healing, longevity. These are great. Um, I think you provide acceptance, positivity. Okay. Now, what's fascinating is notice, I, you all are spot on. Uh, I think, or I try, I hope um, to uh, provide all of those hope, uh, encouragement, positivity. Um, what's interesting is that most of the patients coming there um, are singularly focused on food, um, which is incredibly important, as you know, uh, from this conference. The power of food to bring healing to our whole body um, is, is profound. Um, but really, and as you're going to see over the course of the, our time together, um, I take them through a series of questions that they fill out ahead of time. And then we discuss those during our visit. I think that the number one thing I provide is perspective, is perspective. And I think with a healthy perspective, then all those things that you mentioned come into play, right? With a healthy perspective about ourselves and, and our futures, then we have a sense of hope with uh, a healthy uh, perspective about our life, then we feel encouraged. We feel positive. Um, we, we feel like we're focusing our thoughts and our attention on the things that really matter. And so my goal simply put today is to share a little bit about the various facets that factor into whole person health that can give someone a sense of perspective and then encouragement to pursue those areas that they feel called to work on. Okay, so that's that's the goal. Uh, I, by the way, I love I love the uh, interaction. So at different points, I'm going to go back to the chat box. Uh, that's just how uh, how I like to to lecture. It makes it I think more interesting for everyone and engages not only me but but all of you. Now I did want to tell you a little bit about myself because. Many people assume that I've eaten a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet for my entire life, that I've always been healthy and always been thinking about uh, whole person health and, and attending to all those various aspects. 
Uh, not the case. All right. This, this is a picture of me when I was a kid. I'm the, I'm the little kid in orange uh, with the orange shirt. I was the chubbiest kid in my grade all the way up through fifth grade. Uh, this is actually my older brother, Jonathan, my cousins, Patrick and Josephine, Stephanie, of course, everyone's all grown now. Um, but I just wanted, people always have a hard time believing that I was chubby as a kid. And, and um, I, I was, I'm, and I have a lot of memories of that time of just the insecurities, um, of, you know, that come from being the fattest kid. Uh, I would wait till everyone left and changed in the locker room during PE before I changed. Um, I was always very shy when it came to parties, uh, swim parties. Um, and when, when I think back to that time, it didn't happen by accident, right? I was very much uh, uh, partaking in the standard American diet. And here are a few of my favorite childhood foods. Um, every Friday, we would go through uh, the Wendy's drive through after dinner. We'd always eat out. I grew up in San Diego. Uh, and I would always get a large Wendy's Frosty that I would eat. I, would, I had great willpower in the sense that I would wait until Saturday morning to eat my Wendy's Frosty because that's when the cartoons were on. And so I would, um, you know, take it out of our box freezer and spend the, most of the morning and early afternoon watching cartoons, eating my Wendy's Frosty. Whenever my parents went out for uh, some sort of event, my older brother, Jonathan, he would make a meal of Pillsbury croissants with corned beef hash from, from Price Club, now called Costco. Uh, in uh, San Diego, there is a, a ice university town center, ice, ice chalet uh, with these, um, where they had an orange Julius and I would always get a large orange Julius with a corn dog. I've now learned, by the way, that this orange Julius has over a hundred grams of sugar in it. And you know, as many of you know, there's four grams of sugar in one teaspoon. So if if you do the math, this actually has over 30 teaspoons of sugar in a large orange Julius. Uh, and I would consume that on a on a regular basis. And then one of my favorite desserts was banana splits. I have strong memories of going back to Singapore where my parents grew up and my aunts and uncles, I have many aunts and uncles there who love to spoil me. They would take me out to restaurants. And, and the one criteria we looked for in restaurants was, did they serve a banana split? Because that's, that was uh, the dessert that, that I was treated with. So, you know, I mean, sure, I ate some healthy foods, but I ate a lot, a, a lot of this. Um, and uh, these all fall squarely into the standard American diet of animal-based foods, highly processed foods, high amounts of sugar, high amounts of salt, uh, high amounts of oil. Um, and uh, it is a large reason for why our nation's health is so poor, as many of you know. Now, not to belabor this too much, but since that period, I have gone through an, a, a dietary journey. Uh, so first I stopped at the, I made my stop at the fat-free uh, stop uh, and thought that, okay, as long as I eat foods that were fat-free, then those are healthy, right? And as you know, many of the fat-free foods are highly processed. Uh, and so you're actually not doing your body a service by eating something like these Entenmann's fat-free uh, desserts, which I remember loving. And I thought they were actually good for me. I would eat things like that and gummy bears and drink tons of orange juice uh, and candy. As long as it was fat-free, hey, that's all that mattered. Uh, I made a stop at the whole Mediterranean diet, which I would say overall is much healthier than the standard American diet, but I still think it has a few areas uh, that are, are pitfalls, such as the sort of what feels like the limitless amount of oil that you can use in your foods to cook your foods, um, to put on your salads, um, or really the, what felt like the lack of restriction on, on chicken and, and, and fish. Um, and so just because it's better doesn't mean it's the best, right? Uh, I stopped, this was during medical 
residency, I'm embarrassed to admit that I made a stop at the whole low carb, uh, you know, paleo ketogenic, that whole, um, whole area. And I showed one of the foods that I enjoyed at in and out. This is an in and out double, double animal style burger, where you've got two beef patties, cheese and special sauce, uh, but surrounded by leaves of lettuce. And I, re I, I distinctly remember eating at the in and out I'm here in Santa Rosa now, and we do have an in and out here. And I remember eating at this in and out and getting uh, one of the double, double animal styles and still being hungry. And so I got a second and I left that restaurant proud of myself, despite eating four beef patties, because I had held off on the Coke and French fries. So, you know, each of these shows the sort of, um, you know, they may have some piece of the truth, right? But they're missing, they're missing kind of the whole package. Uh, and again, it's an, it's an issue of perspective, right? I mean, I, I would say that there, there are some healthy aspects of, of, of say a paleo diet. You know, they, people who I know who have eaten paleo tend to focus on at least minimally processed foods. Uh, but again, I think in their uh, enthusiasm for low carb, then they're cutting out so many of the foods we know to be cornerstones of a healthy diet, such as legumes and such as whole grains, uh, and with an over, with an emphasis on animal based foods um, that that is harmful not just uh, for your physical health but also for planetary health. So fortunately, uh, as the video pointed out in PBS, I, uh, on PBS in 2014, I graduated from medical residency in 2013. I, I saw Dr. Furman came on the screen and he mentioned the words whole food plant-based. I had never heard these words despite four years of med school and three years of residency training in family medicine. And he made these outrageous claims about the power of a whole food plant-based diet to not just prevent, but actually reverse chronic illnesses. Uh, and you know, honestly, the rest was history. I had my doubts, but with each book and each documentary uh, that that I read and, you know, learning of the work of Dr. McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Greger, Dr. Campbell, these, these giants, these titans who um, have paved the way um, in terms of uh, Dr. Ornish, paved the way in terms of um, uh, making this, this knowledge and information that we've had available to us all these centuries kind of coming to the forefront. Um, I, I have, I have seen the light, so to speak. And now I really do feel that, um, not only do I eat the healthiest diet on the planet as, as the title of Dr. McDougall's and Mary McDougall's recent book. Um, but I also, uh, spend, my my time trying to pass this knowledge on to others. I sort of think of myself as a messenger. It's not that I need to come up with some original content as much as I need to take what we know and 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 spread the word. So I share this to because I think relatability is key and and very important. And one of the things I hear from my patients, time and time again, is that they don't feel that their medical doctors can relate to what they're going through. Um, and I think sometimes even in the, you know, with plant-based doctors, um, if they've eaten a healthy diet their whole life, they don't actually know what it's like to be stuck in the pleasure trap uh, and to be tempted by foods and to, to binge eat on things that are unhealthy for them. But I've been there. I've done that. I know the psychology of it. I know the um, the temptations and the cravings, uh, and and so I relate. All right. And uh, I've tried so many different diets um, that, as patients describe their history to me, I get it. Right. And uh, and I've wanted you all to know that. So what I like to say is now I don't really eat a whole food plant based diet as much as I live a whole food plant based lifestyle. One that, as Michael Pollan said, I don't think it, I, I, I've, I've not seen it summed up a whole food plant-based diet any better than, or whole food plant-based lifestyle, any better than Michael Pollan, um, food author, journalist, uh, and in his book, In Defense of Food and Eater's Manifesto, these famous seven words that I think really capture it. I love simplicity. 
I don't like overcomplicating things. And so eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I really do think that that captures the essence of a whole food plant-based uh, way of, of, of living or a whole food plant-based diet. You know, eat food that is as minimally processed and in as natural a state of form as possible. Foods that your great, great, great grandmother would recognize as food. Don't eat too much. I think this gets into the mind-body connection. Really starting to kind of tune into the signals your body passes on to you and, and sensing when you've had enough rather than overriding those signals. So I, I love, I love that, you know, that idea of, you know, we don't, we're not going to count calories. I don't tell my patients to count calories. I don't tell them to, to weigh their food, but I really do encourage them to cultivate that connection that they have with between their mind and the body and the signals the body sends back to them. I feel that we're very disconnected from that you know, the, that a lot of our mind body connections have been severed, but they can be rebuilt. Um, and they can be linked together if we really put our mind and attention to it. And then mostly plants. And I really like the word mostly because, um, I think that for some people, perfection can be the enemy of good. And if they get it in this idea that, oh, I can never do that. And I always ask them, what's that? You know, because they've kind of held themselves up to the standard that if they're not eating 100% plant-based, then, then they're not doing it. And I say, look, you know, I mean, Dan Buettner, uh, John Robbins, they've both writ written books about areas around the world where people live well past the age of 100, you know, whether you want to call them blue zones or longevity hotspots, places like Okinawa, Japan and, and Sardinia, Italy. And these were places that they weren't necessarily 100% plant-based, but the vast majority of their nutrition came from fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains. And um, as a result of that, in combination with many other lifestyle factors that we're going to discuss, they, um, they achieved not just longevity, but they achieved um, thriving health, right? They, they were able to um, live thriving lives that were active and full of connection and full of love and joy. Um, many of the factors that you all mentioned earlier. All right. So this was my lunch today, just to give you an idea of how simple it can be. Um, I'll, I'll describe, I'll describe it briefly. I mean, here's uh, just a pot of brown rice, uh, or, uh, with some mixed, mixed, uh, wild rice that, that I, put in the instant pot this morning. It took me about mm, two minutes to make a big pot of it. Uh, this is from a pot of beans I made Friday. Um, yeah, Friday night for a, uh, a social event. Um, they were have the, the host was making carnitas, which is pork, right? Carnitas tacos. Um, so I made my big pot of beans so that I could enjoy my bean tacos. And anyone else was free to partake. And you know what? People all ate the beans that I brought. Um, but this is going to last me easily through the week. Uh, this is a Chinese vegetable called kongxin cai. Or in English, it's basically water, uh, water chestnut vegetable um, that my mother-in-law um, uh, made last week. And then I put half an, av uh, half an avocado. And I usually limit my avocado consumption to you know, about a quarter to a half an avocado a day. I think that's reasonable. I just, I wanted to show you how simple this really is, right? And that this way of eating, it's not, it does not have to be complicated. There's no recipes. Um, it's just simple ingredients. I've got my, my grain, I've got my legume, I've got my vegetable. Um, you know, I've got, uh, I've got my avocado to give it a certain richness and, uh, and then my dessert with strawberries. Let's, uh, let's, let's go to the chat. What did, what did people have for lunch uh, today? What did people share? I'm just reading some of the, uh, all right. So Bobby, you get some quinoa salad and ra raspberries, uh, steamed collards and Brussels or, Arabic, Arabic hummus. Wow. Sprouts. I mean, look at the, look at, look at how beautiful this is, right? All of you, very simple, 
um, very simple lunches, simple meals. It doesn't have to be complicated. Rice and vegetables, potatoes and mushrooms, tofu scramble, hummus, red pepper, and cucumber. Large salad with tofu, quinoa, apple. Beautiful. All right. I think you all get it. Lentil pasta. Steamed sweet potato, three types of sprout salad. <laughs> I feel like you all could teach a course on nutrition. Excellent. All right. So keep on, keep on, you can keep on putting in the chat box up, but I'll move on. So, you know, as my personal way of relationship with food has changed from, you know, following all these various dietary fads over the decades, whether it's low fat, um, low carb, uh, you know, Mediterranean, and then finally landing at whole food plant-based as just a way that I'm going to eat for the rest of my life. So too has my, of course, my, my professional way of interacting with patients. It has to change, right? Because I've just seen how profound an impact food can have upon our health. And um, as I mentioned, I was four years of med school at Boston University, and then three years of family medicine residency. And I like to share this story of Robert uh, as, as symbolic of the paradigm shift that, that has occurred for me um, through the power of food and lifestyle. Now, Robert, um, before he ever changed the way that he ate, weighed um, 298 pounds, blood pressure in the 150s over 90s on uh, four medications, Zetia, which is a cholesterol lowering medication, Norvask, which is blood pressure lowering, uh, powerful blood pressure uh, medication, Pristique, an antidepressant, albuterol, and he was very sedentary. And he had tried, by the way, many diets um, leading up to uh, adopting a whole food plant-based diet. He, he had tried um, uh, low carb, he had tried Metafast and juice fasting and Weight Watchers. Um, I think he had tried Jenny Craig. I mean, he had, he had always had some initial success, 30, 40 pounds. And then sooner or later, it would just, you know, he would, he would rebound because each of these were diets, things that he did for a short period of time, only to return back to kind of his old ways. Um, but uh, eventually he, he saw the light uh, and adopted a whole food uh, plant-based way of eating. And when I met him, I met him two years after uh, he had uh, made the switch. Uh, and this uh, was who uh, greeted me. Uh, 173 pounds, blood pressure in the 110s over 70s, off all medication, uh, and now running, not, not sedentary, but running over five miles per day, incredibly uh, active. He said he had so much energy that if he didn't expend it, he would feel you know sort of bottled up. Um, and this is really what I think, it, when I look at patients now, this is what I uh, feel is, is possible, is not just you know change at the margins, but is kind of a wholesale transformation uh, if they are willing to, to do the hard work of, of changing, fundamentally changing the way that they, they eat and, and live uh, their lives. And I've, I've kept in touch with Robert, I've checked in on him. Uh, over the years, and he has continued um, to to maintain this uh, this way of eating and this way of living. In fact, last time I spoke, he said, "Well, I'm 168 pounds now," um, and he said, "You know, it's not easy. I have to pay attention to it on a daily basis. Um, the moment I get complacent is when I can see myself start to slide. Um, but uh, so I, I have to stay vigilant uh, each each and every day." This was a patient that we took care of at the McDougal program before, um, over 300 pounds. Uh, his name's Josh, uh, and um, he did our. This was in the, he did our in-person program. But McDougal, we run these 10-day uh, in-person programs. But then since COVID, we've converted 100% to being online and virtual, um, which has worked out really well. So now we run these 12-day programs. In fact, right this minute we're in the midst of our May 12 day uh, program. Um, and so he did our in-person program. Uh, he was a real skeptic, uh, but um, he decided he, he was so impressed with his initial results that he decided to stick with it for 60 days. And then after 60 days, um, he was so impressed that he, he just kept with it. And one year later, 
Um, this was Josh. He was uh, down over 60 pounds. Uh, his issues of elevated blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea, GERD had all uh, resolved. And this was just with the power of food. So fundamentally, what, what I see, um, you know, the state of medicine as these days is oftentimes, this is a cartoon that Dr. Ornish showed back in 2015, but it always really uh, sort of stuck with me because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And here you see doctors just mopping up the floor. Um, uh, but the problem is that the sink is, uh, you know, the faucet is still going on full blast in the background. So we're oftentimes taking care of the symptoms on the outside, but we're not dealing with the root cause of the problem. Um, and I think that what you're learning about through this conference is how we turn off the faucet, right? How we really get to the root cause of things um, and address, uh, address problems at their um, upstream uh, uh, origin rather than dealing with the downstream sequela and continuing to sort of butt up, butt our head against the wall again and again. All right, so that's just a little bit of, of, of background. I think it gives you an appreciation for, um, uh, for my own journey, uh, the work that I try to do with my patients, um, the, the stories of total transformation that I've been able to witness. I, I always tell people I feel like, I'm a, I feel like work for me is like, is like being like a kid in a candy store. I mean, so we're like at Disneyland um, because I actually get to see um, happen before my eyes the, 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 the hope and reason I went into medicine, which was to heal people, right? We go into medicine to heal people, but the way that medicine is practiced, we oftentimes feel like we're just mopping up the floor. And uh, through my work with um with patients uh, at the McDougal program, I basically see patients heal uh, uh, from the inside out. What I wanna do in the time we have uh, is define holistic health. Uh, uh, some, some, some cursory definitions that uh, give us an idea of what we're talking about. Better understand the factors that contribute to it, to holistic health. And then hopefully have some time as we go through the questions that patients who come to see me will fill out is to, to have an opportunity to reflect on your own whole person health and what adjustments you may want to make. Um, if by the end of this, you see one area of your life that perhaps you could make some healthy changes to that might not have been on your radar before, I will consider that a huge uh, success because then you will have some enhanced perspective, right? And and that's what I feel uh, one of the things I help my patients with most. So what is uh, holistic health? Well, I'll tell you what it's not, right? Uh, one thing it's not is you know the story of the blind uh, blind people who you know were presented with an elephant and they're asked to describe what an elephant is, and each each of the blind people basically describes it based on what they're experiencing, what their own limited point of view, right? So one person who feels the tail says, oh, an elephant is a rope, or another one who feels the tusk says, you know, an elephant, it's, it's a, it, they think it's a spear, right? Um, and they fail to take into account the whole and the totality because they're unable to see it. So even, you know, I think that one of the huge benefits of, of whole food plant-based eating and this lifestyle is that now rather than look at patients and deal, think of them only in terms of their medical problem and deal with it with medications and surgeries and procedures, now at least we're saying, hey, food is a major issue that has contributed to your diabetes and contributed to your high blood pressure. And so already our, our picture is enhanced a little bit more, right? But now eight years as medical director, one of the things that I've seen is that I've really come to believe that food oftentimes, not always, but I'm saying often, is the symptom. It's actually the symptom. In other words, people 
yes, we live in a toxic food environment. Yes, it's hard to resist. Yes, we're stuck in the pleasure trap. But at the same time, I've just ex- seen and experienced that the, the stress, uh, the lack of connection, the, um, uh, the, the long work hours, uh, the busy travel schedule, that can drive people to make unhealthy choices about their food or their sleep or their movement. And in a way, some of those are upstream even of the food. Okay, so I think that when we think about holistic health, we need to even think beyond food, right? We need to go beyond that. And one one definition from the World Health Organization describes holistic health as, or describes health, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmary, right? A state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmary. Or a, a nice layperson definition, holistic health is your overall state of wellness on all levels of your being, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. It encompasses the health of your entire being and extends to everyone and everything that interacts with you in any way. That includes your resources, your environment, and your relationships. I mean, just imagine it encompasses the health of your entire being and extends to everyone and everything that interacts with you in any way. And so I, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's an ambitious definition, right? Because it's, it's saying that any part of your day is a chance to look at and say, hey, is this, is this what it could be? Or is there, is there a certain thought pattern I engaged in or certain actions I, I did may not even have anything to do with food that were not, what, not showing up as my, as my best, best self or, or all that I, that I could be, okay? This is a, you know, a picture that I, I created um, that I share in my presentations that I give in the McDougall program for when I think of optimal health. These aren't all, but these are many, some of the most important factors that I think that play in. So we've already kind of talked at length about nutrition. And certainly I do encourage my patients to try to eat um, a, a whole food plant-based diet like the McDougall diet with its emphasis on starches uh, as um, the center of the plate in terms of providing satiety and high fiber uh, and all the vitamins and nutrients and minerals that, that they give. Um, physical activity and movement. We're going to get into each of these uh, through the questions that um, I screen my patients with. So we'll talk more, but I just kind of want to give you a bird's eye view, physical activity, how people respond to stress. Um, This is one that I added recently, just because I noticed that people, and I've certainly noticed in my own life, just how much our sense of our our physical surroundings, right, of our home um, and our you know, our, our bedroom and our office and just whether we're dealing with clutter all over the place um, or whether we're able to keep our environment nice and clean and simple. And, you know, I'm going to raise my hand here. This is, this is an area that I'm actively uh, working on. Uh, and so the idea is like, we're not, we're, we don't have to be perfect, right? We need to learn to accept ourselves where we're at in each of these, but but hopefully we have this desire and belief that we can continue to improve. And I, I think that that's what it's about. Uh, meaningful connection with, with friends and family, a sense of purpose and meaning. Uh, for many people, spirituality is uh, central or a, a core part of their lives. And, and so attending to that, um, avoidance of unhealthy behaviors, and then lastly, uh, sleep. And what is the quality are you getting adequate levels of sleep and, um, and is it restful? Do you wake up feeling uh, alert and rested? All right, so uh, we're gonna do, I'm gonna pause again and, and, and go to the uh, a chat box. I'm just kind of curious. Looking, using this as sort of your uh, initial way of viewing all the possible factors that can enter into um, holistic health and a much more three-dimensional view of, of, of health beyond 
um, whether you're eating a, a hundred percent plant-based or a hundred percent oil-free, but really seeing the big picture. Uh, I'll, I'll put the question to you. Um, imagine that, you know, I'm waving a magic wand and you can make one of these things uh, happen. What unhealthy habit or behavior of yours would become non-existent, okay? Or you can answer one or the other. What new healthy habit or behavior would become a reality in your life? What unhealthy habit or behavior of yours would become non, you'd be able to extinguish it, right? Um, or what new healthy habit or behavior would become a reality in your life. And this is just an opportunity for you to take a step back and reflect. If you did a survey of your entire life and you could make one thing go away that you're not, you're not crazy about, or you could bring into uh, existence one new behavior, what, what would it be? Uh, so Abaya uh, mentions overeating. Okay, excellent. Um, to encourage my aunt and brother to become plant-based so they can stop bullying me in my choice. I want to do more grounding. Oh, nice. Okay. Organization of paperwork. Go to bed earlier. I want you all to already notice just how, how widespread and how, how many areas are being covered by the things you're bringing up, right? I mean, I think you all clearly get it that health is so much more uh, than, than focusing just on one thing. Um, I need more movement, regular exercise, stretching, yoga, weights, decluttering. Now you, you all see why I put organization as one of the factors. <laughs> Janet writes, ability to communicate with others without negativity. Ooh, that's, that's a good one. These interpersonal uh, skills and noticing what comes up for us as we, as we interact with others. Um, Ainsley kind of uh, refers to that as well, right? With the interactions between her aunt and, and her brother. Uh, I want to learn to use my new Instant Pot. I like it, very concrete, simple. Um, but potentially revolutionary, right? Um, yeah, I, I will say that the Instant Pot is absolutely my best friend in the kitchen. Uh, going to bed late, start drinking 80 ounces of water daily. It's Bobby. Um, Ainsley writes, encourage my class to stop eating Cheetos, stop procrastinating, drink more water and start meditating. Decluttering. And Barbara, okay, this is a good tip from Barbara. Check out Andrew Mellon, the web and his videos on YouTube. He also has a five-day webinars called Declutter Your Mess. Very helpful. Procrastinating and decluttering. This is great. Okay. So um, you can see just how, right, how varying they are. We've, we've talked about organization. We've talked about sleep. We've talked about how our interpersonal you know, interactions. Um, we've talked about some skills in the kitchen and cooking. And, and that's really what I hope that you, you all continue because notice how personal each of these is to, to you, how uniquely linked it is to each one of you, right? One, the thing that matters to one of you, another person may not have any issues with that, right? I've, I've learned that for some people, clutter is not a challenge. Um, many of you may already know how to use an instant pot um, with, without any difficulty. Uh, so, one of my huge priorities when I'm interacting with patients is to get them to come up on their own with what matters most to them, right? So that it's very much coming from an internal place of desire, not because someone's saying, you must do this, you should do this, and it's externally driven. And that's something I want you to think about as you go forward is, that, am I doing this because, because I have bought into it. And I think that this is what I need. I've actually taken the time to take stock and reflect and, and this is what I've arrived at. Or am I doing this to please someone else or because someone else is telling me that this is what I should do. Um, and I would put forth that that may be well-meaning, but I don't think that that's the most, uh, that's the best place for real, true, long-term change and, and transformation. All right. 
<clears throat> let's see what we're doing. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I do want to take a, uh, at, you know, about the one 55 minute, one hour mark, I want um, to give you a little bit of a break because uh, you don't want to sit for longer than an hour at a time in general without getting up, standing up and stretching. Okay, so it, in an effort to start to practice what we, we preach, we'll take a, take a break just so um, you all can kind of have an idea of what to expect. So I think you have an idea of what we're talking about with holistic health, right? With the pictorial diagram, with these definitions that include our physical, our emotional, our social, our spiritual well-being, all of whom we are, every part of every day, it's all an opportunity for thinking about our whole self. Um, now what I want to do is kind of show you some of the actual questions uh, that my that patients who come to see me will fill out. So you kind of get an idea that when, when, when I'm doing a consultation, what are the things that I'm seeing and, and asking them about and, you know, wanting them to, to pay attention to. And here are the instructions for this, this survey. We know that diet exercise habits and daily routines have a huge impact on your overall wellness. Below is a series of statements related to your overall lifestyle, nutrition, sleep, movement, Please examine each statement and indicate to what extent you agree or disagree with the statement. If the question does not apply or you prefer not to answer, you can select not applicable. Please answer as truthfully as possible. Dr. Lim will review your answers carefully and discuss the results with you during your visit together, as well as any recommendations he has for you going forward. So I wanted our session together to be very just practical and hands-on. And again, a chance for you to reflect on your own life and to see if anything comes up that, huh, I hadn't really thought about it that way, or that might be something that uh, I need to pay attention to, all right? So we'll, we'll look at the first couple areas and then we'll take a break. All right, so first is nutrition. And um, I'll kind of show you some of the questions I look at uh, when, when we're doing it. So I eat a healthy whole foods plant-based diet based on fruits, vegetables, legumes, and whole grains the vast majority of the time. Right. And this was an actual patient. I actually, I took an actual patient's responses, right? This is just a, a sample. I didn't even think too much about it. I just took, you know, when I, when I created this, I took the last patient I'd seen and, and these were her responses. Of course, I've taken out the name for anonymity purpose, but it gives you, you know, a, a sense of the, the, the average patient I might see. And this person was not eating, doing that. Okay. But this is, and those, I didn't say all of the time, um, or, you know, exclusively as a, you know, the vast majority of the time. And so disagree. I avoid eating foods with added sugar, right? Is sugar an issue for you? Do you, do you have a sweet tooth? Do you end up eating more of these uh, sweet foods? If you do just know you're not alone, you're in very good company, but you got to own it. Right? You got to acknowledge it. If sweets are an issue for you, um, is, uh, the oil and butter, um, uh, a, a challenge? Do you find that you just, you, you can't uh, do without it? Um, nuts and seeds, right? Controversial subject, even people within the plant-based movement might disagree with it. As you can kind of get a sense of my personality, for me, it's not, I'm not sort of this all or nothing kind of guy. Um, I think that for people who are all or nothing, they need to find that for themselves. Just my experience, right? I had a glass of wine on uh, yesterday, my, my wife and I went to a fundraiser. Um, if I was an alcoholic and I had a, a, a troubled relationship with alcohol, that would be a horrible idea. <laughs> right? I would not have recommended that glass of wine. So one of the things I really encourage patients to do is, is rather than kind of take some hard and fast rule and just say, this is the rule and it must apply to everyone, is really kind of take the principle at play and most times it's looking at your relationship with various foods or substances and, and just being honest and asking myself, is this a healthy or an unhealthy relationship with this substance, right? So I would say the same with nuts. I, in general, I don't have a problem with my patients who can limit their nut consumption to less, less than an ounce a day, even my overweight patients, because even though nuts are very calorically dense and, um, you know, maybe high in fat. I think that if they limit it to less than an ounce a day and they're eating healthy otherwise, in my experience, I have not seen that be the big issue. But that's very different than someone who's taking 
you know, their Costco bin of pistachios to the couch and peeling them and consuming huge amounts of that, thinking it's a healthy snack for them to be eating while watching Ted Lasso on Apple TV. <laughs> you get the idea. Um, I do not drink sugar sweetened beverages, including soda and fruit juice. Uh, so in this case, this patient, all right, at least sugar sweetened beverages, not an issue. Eating out, huge, huge uh, problem because many patients kid themselves into thinking that they can, as long as they eat vegan when they're eating out, then it's okay. And I think you all are savvy enough to know that uh, when we eat out, there's so much stuff that gets added into the food that we don't really have control over. My take home is not don't eat out, but in depending on your health history and depending on your goals, um, you may need to significantly cut back um, or you need, need, may need to be much more thoughtful about your um, times that you eat out, the frequency with which you eat out, where you go to eat out, what you order when you eat out, right? This is a whole big area in and of itself. Um, and then just what's their relationship with their weight and, and how pleased are they with their current weight, right? So this, I mean, it's not, you can tell this is not exhaustive, but at a, at a glance, it gives me um, a, a sense of some of the, uh, um, the, the, the factors like eating out or the nuts or the sugar um, that, that may not be on their radar and may not uh, have their attention. And this is a, 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 a call for me to maybe touch upon that in, in our visit together. Um, the next one, this one is big, okay? And this is actually the subject of an entire lecture of mine uh, during the 12-day program uh, on emotional eating. And you, this really looks at a person's relationship with food, right? If, if I had to, you know, call out one word as hugely important, it's the word relationship, right? And because... Um, oftentimes it's not like, do I think a, I'm going to take something really unhealthy? Do I think like a Krispy Kreme donut is a Krispy Kreme donut, some evil food in and of itself? I don't think so. I mean, I don't think it's, it's evil food, food, but I think that your relationship with Krispy Kreme donuts can become incredibly unhealthy. Right. And so you've got to know that about yourself. And if you're ending up eating donuts all the time, then that's a problem, right? But if, I don't know, if it was your grandkid's birthday and there was their dream that they got Krispy Kreme donuts and you had, you know, it's, it's been a long time since you've had a donut and you, you enjoy a donut, do I, I, I would hope that you would then be able to enjoy that donut, right? And not feel guilty as you're eating it um, because it's a thought, thought out intentional decision. So I'm going to keep bringing it back to relationships. So here are some of the questions that I that I talk, uh, will screen patients with when I'm trying to understand the relationship with food. I frequently turn to food when I experience strong emotions such as anxiety, boredom, anger, stress, sadness, et cetera. And notice that this patient checked off agree. And what this tells me is that food is their comfort during difficult times, right? It's pure and simple that when they have difficult, uncomfortable emotions that they, they experience, that food is where they go to. And I'm just gonna tell you that I understand that, you know, I've, I believe that food in some respects has been a friend that has gotten people through difficult times. It's just that most of the people, when they see the health consequence, long-term health consequences that result, they realize that food is not the best solution. For the, for the difficult feelings they're dealing with and that it never solves the problem that they're grappling with. And so that if they want to take their health to the next level, they first need to realize the role that food is taking in their lives when they're going through difficult times and just be able to acknowledge it and see that which maybe is unseen because many people don't even realize the, the role that food is coming to take in their lives in times of difficulty. So first is seeing it. And then from there, once they see it, is do they desire to do something about it? And then from there, it's, well, what 
is the first step that you can take to actually improve your relationship with it so that you don't turn to food as much or at least turn to as unhealthy of foods as you've been looking to. Because I will say that it's rare that someone says that, oh yeah, when I'm stressed out, I eat carrots with no oil hummus. <laughs> I mean, it does happen, right? But most times what they're, they're choosing are sweets or French fries or, you know, salty things and lots of them, right? And, and most of this tends to happen late at night or when they've, after a long day of work. So more questions. I frequently eat until the point that I feel stuffed and uncomfortable. Remember, we talked about the mind-body connection and how severed it is. Anytime that you eat to the point that you feel stuff, stuffed and uncomfortable, let's just be honest. You have overrode your body's signals back to your brain saying, you've had enough to eat. It's okay that you, you can stop now. Or we've eaten so fast that we didn't even give the signals time to get back to our brain. This happened to me as recently as Friday. Right? So it's not, again, we're not after perfection here. It's not going to say that that's not going to happen or the goal is that this never happens. Really, for me, with my patients, my goal is that they increase their awareness that this is happening. Because with that awareness, then the likelihood that they can do something about it so that the frequency of times that they overeat and they eat until they're uncomfortable goes down dramatically. I mean, I can tell you, uh, I, I used to eat way more frequently to the point that I was stuffed. I, I just had it in my head that that was the point of, of eating till you're full. And I had to retrain my brain to say, oh, wait, no, you can actually stop when you could still eat more but you don't feel that you don't need to. And that's the point of what I'd call satiety or satiation rather than being stuffed, right? So that's kind of helping patients to, excuse me, work on their mind-body connection. Um, I frequently feel guilty or ashamed about how much food or what type of food I find myself eating. I find that shame is a pretty corrosive uh, emotion. I think it's good to be aware of it but I try to move. I think that we're already hard on ourselves and as, as it is. And I think that perhaps one of the greatest um, kindnesses or, or steps that we can do for our own self-efficacy, our self-improvement um, is actually, I'm just going to say it, is to start being kind and nice to ourselves. It's, it's, it, it hurts to see how harsh my patients are towards themselves. And this includes, by the way, some of my healthiest patients, my healthiest patients who are eating, you know, a perfect plant-based diet and exercising every day, the language in their heads and the way that they talk towards themselves is incredibly self-critical. And so even though they may be enjoying good physical health, they're not happy. They're not content. And so I can't help but look at that and say, okay, you may get all the check marks, total cholesterol less than 150, LDL less than 70, BMI of, you know, 21.2, blood pressure 110 or 70, contentment not, you know, and there, 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 there's something being missed there. Um, and there, so you know, helping patients. So it's not so much shame, um, but just being honest with themselves. Okay. Like, um, what is it that I'm committing to do in terms of my eating? And then more just kind of getting them to learn what it looks like to live according to their word and what they commit to. And then if they eat something off plan, that is against what they committed to, you don't necessarily need to be ashamed but rather use that as an opportunity for learning and growth. Like, huh, you know, I committed to only eating out once per week for the next eight weeks to see how that went. And lo and behold, I ate out three times. So I don't know that shame is what I need to feel as much as it is like, what's going on? <laughs> like, was one too ambitious? Do I need to, you know, was that too big of a jump? Uh, do I need to change my my social environment? Do I need to recommit? You know, it's, it's, it's a chance to go back to the drawing board and figure things out.
right? I often find myself snacking even when I'm not hungry. That's what we call the mindless eating, right? That's a sign again, that you're just using food as a filler, um, not because you're actually hungry. And so food is, does not really have its rightful place. Um, I frequently snack after dinner. I'm gonna tell you that I know of no physiological need for people to eat after dinner, except in rare cases, like maybe the diabetic who's on insulin and then they have a low blood sugar, then maybe they need to eat an orange or an apple to bring their blood sugar up. But in general, most of the reasons that we snack after dinner is because of just habit and cravings. And when we can start to outsmart those and say, talk back to those cravings and say, hey, 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 I know you're, you're the body saying, I want to eat that bowl of cereal, you know, and if I don't, I'm going to feel weak. But I know that I'm going to survive if I don't eat now. And, you know, trust me, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to realize like, wow, I'm not any hungrier now than if I, when I snack after dinner, maybe I don't need that bowl of cereal after dinner after all. And, um, you know, my recommendation oftentimes to patients is that they brush their teeth after dinner and just create one more barrier between them and, and snacking. Now, if you're, if you're making trans, you know, it, again, I'm all about meeting patients where they are at, right? So if in order to help them transition over, they just, benefit from, you know, having an apple or a, a, a baked potato after dinner, uh, um, because they're making so many other changes, then fine, then great, you know, it's this, it, it, but being aware of that, because for some people, it can be more of an issue, especially depending on the foods they're eating. Uh, I often feel like food controls me rather than the other way around. I feel very self conscious eating a McDougal diet around other people who do not eat similarly, this kind of gets at um, how subject you are to the opinions of others right? Which can, can that impact your long-term ability to sustain this way of eating? Yes, absolutely. Right. So then that I might be talking to that patient more about like, Hey, why do we care so much about what other people think you're doing the right thing here? You're trying to do right by your body. Can we learn to present yourself so that you don't have to feel defensive about engaging in behavior that is good for your own physical health, as well as planetary uh, health and 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 the the health of our our, our beloved creatures on this earth. <laughs> what why why do you need to feel shy or embarrassed about about that? I get it, right? I get it because we live in this culture where people you you feel like you're swimming upstream sometimes, but it doesn't mean we can't learn to be to learn to be more confident and at peace being who we are, irrespective of the opinions of others, right? Um, and then again, a sort of a social question is I frequently find myself eating unhealthy food in social situations in order not to rock the boat. The, these, both these questions get around our susceptibility to other people. Um, and sometimes I'm, I, I really, my counsel to patients will be trying to help them build up that aspect of themselves, either through some other, through a book or through a program, um, just learning to stand on their own two feet, feel comfortable in who they are. Um, and and not be so swayed by the ver the varying opinions of of others, even if they're close family members. As as one of you mentioned earlier, two of your family members are bullies, right? For that person, you can bet that being able to interact with those two people in a way that's healthy and loving yet stands for truth that's gonna be absolutely essential for that individual who, who, who commented earlier, okay? Um, it's 3.05, uh, so here's what we did. We've covered the food bits. I'm gonna hit the others after the break. What I wanna do is I wanna take a five minute break and um, use this to use the restroom, but also use this to move your body. So walk around, stretch a bit, and then come back um, refreshed, okay? So I'm gonna pause now and um, we'll come back in five minutes at 310. See you soon. Hope you had a nice little break. <clears throat> Let's go back. By the way, I didn't used to have those breaks, but then I actually got that. Um, I'm a big believer in feedback, so I would always ask for feedback. And uh, patient said, oh, it'd be nice to have a little bit of a break. And so I, um, I've inserted it in. And ever since I've 
it's at the, I was like, huh, we, are, we have to continually be thinking, how do we put into practice what we preach, right? And if one of our <laughs> things that we preach is don't be sedentary, then, hey, it's just not a good idea to sit for longer, be sitting for longer than an hour at a time. So just keep that in mind. If you, you know, every, every hour set a time or something, five minutes of walking around, stretching the uh, legs, um, uh, uh, getting some fresh air. Okay, so I think this gives you another, I, this, I could spend, I could have spent the whole lecture just on this slide, honestly, is the relationship with food. It's, it's that, it's that big uh, of, of an issue uh, for many people. Um, and even people who are, are, are healthy. Um, I, I, I still myself sometimes uh, struggle with uh, turning to food when I'm stressed out. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll eat healthier food. <clears throat> I may actually go to the fridge and get an apple, but if I'm being really honest with myself, I'm not getting that apple because I'm actually hungry or I need to eat an apple. I'm doing it because I'm stressed out and I'm stuck working on a PowerPoint slide like this or PowerPoint presentation. And the feeling of being stuck is so uncomfortable that I need to get up and do something and eating something is some sort of like release, right? Because I, I kind of just thought about it. Like, why do I do this? And um it's gotten much, much better. I do it far less frequently. I still do it though, um, but it's much less of an issue. And that all started by just being able to recognize it and see it. And I can say that I feel healthier in terms of my emotional health as a result of uh, learning to let go of that dependency on food as a as sort of an emotional comfort. I hope that makes sense. We can talk more uh, during the Q&A about that. Um, I look at patient, uh, patient social relationships. So, uh, I feel, you know, what, if you think about it, we talk so much about the, what's the food that you have in your home, because if you have unhealthy food in your home, it's going to be far easier to, um, for you to eat it. Well, what about the people in your home? How, how close do you feel with the people, uh, that actually live in the home? Um, because if you don't feel close with them, do we think that that could pose as a problem in terms of your stress and how you feel and whether you're able to make healthy decisions about what you eat? Absolutely, right? So I asked about sense of closeness with members of the immediate household. Um, I have at least one or two very close friends or family members who truly know me and love me for who I am. I think this is arguably the greatest gift that we could be given or we could have. I will tell you that this patient was fortunate that she strongly agreed with this. I will tell you that many people are either in disagree or strongly disagree, which is, um, which is sad, but it's not a fixed thing. So when I see that, I kind of alert my patient to the, the fact that this is a real problem because it means that when they're going through a difficult time, there's not a single person they can turn to to talk about it. Um, and so just by bringing that to their attention, um, I also try to give them a sense of hope that that's, it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually start to go out and make an effort towards building those relationships, either by joining <clears throat> some community of a common interest or, or, or seeking uh, therapy. Um, there's, there's so many different ways. Uh, what about your sense of community and belonging in the neighborhood that you live in? Uh, for people who are married or in a significant relationship, uh, do you feel like your partner loves you unconditionally and is very supportive of you? <laughs> I'll never forget one. This was uh, just within the last year, uh, a highly successful business person uh, who joined the McDougal program and was already eating a very healthy uh, McDougal diet, but just kind of coming for some more reinforcement uh, that he answered this question in the disagree uh, or strongly disagree. And we talked about it in our initial visit. Um, and um, in the end, uh, you know, we had some conversations. And by the end of the program, he told me the most significant thing that came out of his involvement with our 
um, 12 day program is that he and his wife are going to couples therapy. Um, and he was very grateful uh, because he was, it wasn't really, it was something he was aware of, but it was not really something that was high on his priority list, nor something that he necessarily felt like there was much hope that there could be anything to do there. And just through the process of talking about it, bringing it to your attention, me putting out there that I think this is a real issue um, and not what is possible, um, things changed. Okay, so uh, I, was, I was very excited to hear that. Um, if I'm a parent, I feel close with my child children. I'm a father of a 15-year-old son, Joshua, and an 11-year-old daughter, Julia. Um, my wife and I have been married almost 20 years now. We met freshman year at Stanford. Um, these relationships are just, I mean, I can't even begin to describe to you how important they are in my life. Um, and I, I prioritize them. I put time, I put attention, I put thought um, into, into cultivating and developing those relationships. Um, and I think that for me, being, being a father has been an incredible privilege. Um, and uh, I encourage, you know, whenever possible, if appropriate, uh, parents to, um, to, be, to be mindful of those relationships and to think about that. And if there's ways of continuing to improve, improve, improve that sense of closeness. I even talk about sexual life. <laughs> I'm satisfied with my sexual life. Okay, so this, these are kind of the, the social relationship questions. Um, I'm going to start to speed up because I want to have time for you all to ask questions, but movement is, is uh, hugely important. It's shocking how many of my patients are eating a healthy McDougal diet or a healthy plant-based diet, but are, are pretty sedentary. Um, and I don't think that's okay. I think that these, these joints and these bones and these muscles, uh, they've, they've, they're a gift. Um, and we're meant to move them. And when we don't move them, they decline, right? Your bones, people are so worried about osteoporosis and yet they're not doing resistance training. Well, if you don't want to, de to, to you know, have a fall and get a bone fracture, uh, like a hip fracture or uh, a shoulder humeral fracture or a wrist fracture, then just ask yourself the simple question, am I doing something about it? Am I actually putting stress on all the various bones and muscles of my body on a consistent basis so that what I'm sending the message to my body is that, hey, I expect something from you. You can't just sit idle. Um, it, you're, you're gonna, I'm gonna put you through your paces. During that five minute break, right? I use the restroom. And then I did 20 push-ups. Okay. And um, that's one of my habits is that every time I use the restroom, I try to do some little like 20, 30 seconds. Uh, and, you know, you, over the course of a day, if I do that, I can sometimes do 80 or hundred push-ups in the course of a day. I have a pull-up bar in my room. So it, it doesn't mean that you have to go to the gym, but are you just being consistent about doing something little bits? Um, uh, for my patients who are sedentary, I get them to try and start with 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes of walking, something that's so small that they can't turn it down. Right. Or whatever. If, if someone, I have one person this past weekend who I, who I interviewed that is in such a profound state of depression, highly intelligent individual that is in such a profound state of depression that the first thing she said to me on the call was, I can't do anything. I don't do anything. I can't cook anything. I mean, you're getting the theme, right? Just these absolute statements of an inability to do anything. And most of my visit was just trying to get her to see like, you know, is to, to question the validity of those statements, to see those as lies that, that were not true. I mean, the fact is she said, I, 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 I asked her, well, can you do any walking? She said, well, yes, I can do some walking. I said, well, how much can you do? When she, she said, I can walk around the park once. Okay. That's something, right? That's something. 
And, and so we need to really remember what I said, the number one thing is how hard we are on ourselves. We really, really need to watch the way that we talk to ourselves because you're going to spend more time listening to your own thoughts than probably any other person in this world, right? So it behooves you to have the thoughts that you're telling yourself be ones that are constructive, encouraging, and helpful rather than condemning, accusatory, and degrading, and humiliating, and put downs. <laughs> it's just common sense. Um, now, I'm saying this, and yet it, it's tough. I get it. Um, but I, I told her, well, okay, so you, I want you to start with one lap. And maybe multiple times a day, you're doing one lap, but you do what you can, and then you build on that. You start somewhere. And then you build on that and build on that. And you don't compare yourself to the fact that your friend, this person is maybe running up mountains each day because that's them. That's their journey. You're on your journey. So you start where you are and then you build on that, right? So these questions are just kind of getting at, are they moving on a daily basis, getting uh, some combination of moderate and, and vigorous uh, phys intensity, physical activity, is it balanced between strength training, cardiovascular balance and flexibility? You know, uh, first if, for someone who's sedentary, I just try to get them to move period. I don't even try and talk to them about cross training or resistant training, but then I have some people who are walking 45 minutes a day for the last 10 years and can't do a push up. right? They cannot push their body from the ground up, but they've been spending 45 minutes walking a day they're ready to start to expand their exercise regimen to include some resistance training. And if they start off with knee push-ups, then start off with knee push-ups. Until my 30s, I could not do a, a single pull-up. And I remember I ran the Boston Marathon, you know, in the early 2000s. And um, it was an amazing experience. But after that, my body was pretty thrashed. And it dawned on me that I could run 26.2 miles in under four hours, but I couldn't lift my own body weight. <laughs> right. And I said, there's a little bit of an imbalance there. If I can run 26.2 miles, but I don't have the physical strength to take myself from a hanging position to this, what we call a pull up. Right. And so I said, I'm going to do something about that. And so I just kind of worked on this building up these lats and, uh, the, my shoulder muscles. Now I can do 10 pull-ups. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that I feel like I can do something that I couldn't do when I'm at supposedly at the peak of my health in my twenties, but it took that sort of awareness of an imbalance and then deciding, Hey, I'm going to do something about that. And it's not, it didn't happen overnight, but over time it has happened lately. What I've been working a lot on is flexibility. It's like, okay, I don't like the fact that I can do a 10 pull-ups, I can do push-ups, I can hold a plank for three minutes, I can run, you know, miles without difficulty, hike up mountains, but I can't touch my toes. <laughs> like there's an imbalance there, right? So I've been doing more yoga and more flexibility. Um, and again, right, it's clearly, it's just starting where you're at um, and figuring out what's the next logical step in your overall health journey. Um, I think subjective perception matters. So how do you feel your physical fitness is? Because if you don't feel physically fit, it's going to reflect itself in your health, right? So working on those aspects of your physical health that, that contribute to you not feeling physically fit, whether it's that you can't walk two miles without difficulty or, or whether it's that you have aches and pains. So maybe you need to do more stretching. I, you know, it's going to be different for each person, but these are questions that start to get at it. Um, this is actually a medical test. Can you get up and down from a chair easily without using your hands? And if you can't, that's okay, but then start where you're at. Use, use supports to push yourself up and make that be your exercise. Um, and then over time, hopefully you can go from a, you know, you can just put your arms out, be sitting in a chair, go up and go down and go up and go down, right? That takes a lot of of, of core thigh strength. And that's very much a, a goal worthy of working towards. You get the idea. So that's the movement piece. Um, <clears throat> purpose. This is perhaps one of my favorite subjects to talk out about. Again, each of these slides could easily be the two hour lecture in and of itself, but this is again, a bird's eye survey 
Um, I'm just going to sort of read down these. I feel that my life has a deep sense of purpose and meaning. I generally feel good about what I do on a daily basis. If I'm currently employed, I find my work meaningful. If I'm currently employed, I do not feel like my work is unduly stressful. Um, I am satisfied with the way that I spend my leisure time. By the way, all of these questions are, you know, we know from the from the blue zones, this concept of ikigai, you know, the Japanese word for, you know, uh, um, why I wake up in the morning. So when you wake up in the morning, do you feel like you have a sense of purpose and there's some meaning and significance? And if not, that's okay. But then I've had many conversations with patients where they're retired and they're kind of just, they're eating out of boredom. I mean, isn't that interesting? They're eating out of boredom. They're coming to me thinking that I'm going to help fix their food and that food is an issue. And I basically tell them, well, yes, it, it's, it's the problem. It's contributing to the fact that now you're overweight and hypertensive. But upstream from that, you're bored. You are potentially in the best time of your life where you're retired, you've, lit, you've worked hard your whole life. You can finally have some time to yourself and you don't know what to do. That's a problem. That may be a bigger problem even than the food that you're eating because I can fix your food. But as soon as you start to feel the feelings of boredom come on, then guess what? Sometimes that, those feelings are so strong, it hijacks your knowledge of what you should be eating and you're back to the standard American diet. So I say, yes, let's work on your food. But in parallel to that, let's work on cultivating a sense of purpose and significance in your life and what that what what might be the steps that we can start to take to work towards that okay um for many people religion and spirituality is either in a very important part of their life or it's a part of their life that used to be important when they were young and then for one reason or another it kind of fell off the radar and so i don't you know i don't uh, it's not trying to convert anyone to one thing or another it's just sort of asking is that something in your life and is that something you can start to cultivate and strengthen? Because again, we know, I mean, I thought it was interesting out of 263 centenarians that Dan Buettner interviewed, 259 of them belonged to some, had some form of spiritual beliefs. I mean, that, that tells you something, right? And we know from studies um, that uh, people who, who belong in some spiritual community, they have better health outcomes. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very open about my faith. I'm Christian. Um, and I can just share from my own personal uh, life that it, it is the center. It is the absolute center of my life and that I see everything in my life through my lens of faith. And it has by far been the most transformative force in my own, own life. And, uh, and when I think of some of the behavioral changes I've made, things that most people are not even thinking about. Um, that's, that certainly has come from my faith. And I've heard that same thing from people who are Buddhist and uh, Muslims and Seventh-day Adventists and Jewish. And I mean, you know, the whole range of religious beliefs. Um, and so I just, it's, all, it's virtually always my encouragement for people who have that as a part of their life um, to, to cultivate it, okay? And then this, this question is interesting. In general, I feel content and at peace with my life, right? Because I think that's something we all long for. We, you know, many of us have been richly blessed with many things that we're grateful for. And yet we find in the day-to-day -day things that we're going through in life that we feel discontent and we feel ill at ease and we feel anxious and we feel stressed out and we feel this delta between what we're experiencing and what we know is possible. And so it's really just sort of a pointing that out and then saying, what do we, what, what, what do we do about that? Right. And what are the steps that we can take? Um, some questions on stress, stress management. Uh, do you take a, a, a portion of each day to rest and relax? I, I like this idea of rhythms, right? And if we believe that in a week, let's just take one week. I, th I think of weekly rhythms. Right. So, you know, people in Seventh day Adventist background have this down. They have their Sabbath, and that's one day of the week that they just put aside for work, uh, put work aside 
and rest and spend time with each other, you know, oftentimes going for long walks or cooking meals together. I think that's a nice weekly rhythm, but I think that weekly rhythm needs to be superimposed upon our days so that there's a daily rhythm and that each day there is a period where you are disconnected from your phones, your devices, your work deadlines, the stressors. And even if it's half an hour or, you know, 20 minutes that you're doing something that is truly restorative and rejuvenating. All right. And, and, you know, after this lecture, we've already, I've already worked it out. I'm going with my wife and kids and we're headed for the hills. All right. That's where we're going. Where it's Sunday. We're going to go off to the hills and we're going to go with our dog and we're going to be out in nature and it is going to be very restorative. Um, do you have stress reducing activities that you engage in that help you to cope with the daily challenges and stressors that I face? One of the questions that I ask is I, uh, on the questionnaire is on a scale of one to 10, what is your level of stress? And so much of the time it's seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, it's it's pretty off the charts. And then the next question I ask is, how do you cope? What do you do in response to these high stress feelings? And oftentimes the answer is eat. Um, so let's see, some recent answers is eat, binge eat, um, uh, feel anxious, uh, get angry. <laughs> I mean, these are right. You're taking already a difficult situation. And I think we would all agree with the, with the way that you're coping, it can often become worse. And so when I see that, then, you know, I'll encourage my patients. I say, I think a top priority is starting to develop a set of coping skills for when you're going through difficult periods that are more aligned with what you know to be in the direction of health that you want to head in. I mean, certainly having hobbies that you enjoy um, can be helpful. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and then finances is, you know, it, what is your relationship with finances and how stressful is it? That just kind of gives me an idea of um, you know, their financial well-being and, and, and how much that's playing into things. Uh, one, two, three, last three. All right. And then we'll take, uh, this is just a mental well-being uh, check, you know, it looks at anxiety and how, how difficult you, a time you have controlling your worrying and, and whether you're, you know, you're able to relax your fears of things uh, awful happening in the future, whether you become easily annoyed or irritable. Uh, I like this question. I spend more than an hour a day watching or reading about current events, unless you have some, you know, very important role that you like. I recently, I had someone who follows the financial markets and that's part of his work. So he says, it really is important that I'm very abreast of the current events. I'm like, okay, you get a pass. If you want to spend an hour, more than an hour, I get it. But most, many people who are spending more than an hour, they can on it. When I really press them on it, they can acknowledge that it's not actually helpful for their mental and emotional well-being. And, and then I'm like, why do you do it then? You know, and it's just become some way of going about their day that it's on in the background, even though it's not helping them to feel better. So I think that usually you don't need more than an hour to find out the major things that you need to stay aware and informed. Um, and usually more than that, the way news are these days, it just kind of tends to, you know, bring us down. And so I think that it's important to think about what you fill your mind with and it's not that you want to be a Pollyanna and everything's all good, but you also don't want to weight it so heavily towards all that's going wrong. And I think the news tends to focus on the things that are going wrong and not the things that are going right. Um, so you want to be mindful of that, pay attention to it, and then take steps to limit, I think, your exposure to things that bring you down. Um, and then these are this sort of a depression screen uh, I frequently feel bad about myself or that I'm a failure and let myself or my family down. That's a very heavy, heavy feeling to carry um, and uh, will oftentimes come out in our conversations. And then just to what extent your mental, emotional state affects your ability to function at work or at home or with other people. And so that's the mental well-being screen. Um, some questions around sleep, how much you're getting. Do you wake up feeling rested? 
Um, are you dependent on caffeine to get you through the day? How easily do you fall asleep? Um, do you have some form of regular sleep schedule? And then uh, do you require something to help you fall asleep? Sleep is so critically important uh, to our overall well-being and the, the, it's insidious, the impact that it can have when we're sleep deprived. It doesn't kind of hit you over the head. It's this subtle insidious influence and so um, I like to call patients' attention to that and make them aware of it. And, and we'll oftentimes engage in conversations around sleep hygiene. And then last, I look at just potential unhealthy uh, habits. Well, certainly tobacco smoking, enough said. Um, but like I mentioned with alcohol, it's not that I have some patients that have a glass of uh, red wine on Fridays with their dinner. And most of the time that doesn't raise a red flag, but... Um, I've also had those patients where, you know, it's interesting, especially during COVID, right? During COVID, uh, many of my patients' alcohol consumption skyrocketed and they hadn't really thought about it. It just happened so subtly, subtly, slowly, insidiously. And here they are now months, years later, and they're drinking regularly half a bottle of wine every day of the week. You know, it's uh, for this a ton of time. Yep, my spouse or my partner and I, we didn't used to do this, but now we open a bottle of wine and, you know, you never want to leave a little bit. So we, I can easily consume half a bottle of wine. And it's not enough that it's like caused some major thing, but it's enough that it has become a dependency that is compromising their health. And so just raising their awareness of that. Um, cannabis, recreational drugs outside of cannabis, um, even coffee. Again, it's not like, I, I, I don't tell my patients who are drinking coffee, like you must stop drinking coffee, but it all depends on their relationship with coffee. If they're drinking coffee throughout the day and then having trouble sleeping at night and then taking something to help them sleep at night, well, you can see we're kind of chasing our tail here a bit, right? Um, because the half-life of caffeine can be as much as six to eight hours, which means that even that coffee that you've had at 8 a.m. in the morning when you go to bed at 10 p.m., you could still have up to 25% of it coursing through your bloodstream. So you want to be aware of that. And if sleep is an issue or anxiety is an issue, then you may want to think about your coffee. Or, um, you know, uh, as as many people say, it's the company that co comes with it, right? So if, if that coffee, in order to consume, comes with oat milk creamer that you're using on a daily basis and you're hoping to lose weight and bring your blood pressure down, then you may want to rethink that daily habit of putting, even though it's vegan and plant-based oat milk creamer in your coffee every day. All right. Uh, and then last, um, social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or I would just say uh, iPhone time or smartphone time in general. Um, I'm not going to go and belabor this, but people are, are glued to their screens. Um, uh, and again, it's, uh, it's rare that people can tell me that the, the huge amounts of time they spend on, on these applications, uh, does their soul good. Okay. So just helping them to be aware of that. Now, what do we do with all this? Okay. So those are the, the every patient that comes to see me, they fill that out and they, they do that screen. You can tell now when I see this patient, I've never even met them. I have this whole whole picture before me. And each one is like your DNA. It's like your unique fingerprint. And you, you know, this book is my, you know, it's just patient after patient that I write the notes. I'll always put like the, the, the things that I'm seeing from my perspective that are potential things that they, that if they want to take their health to the next level, they need to be thinking about. Okay. I don't want them to be overwhelmed but I want them to also be able to see that which they may not have seen. And so, you know, when I think of it in terms of what do we do with this? Well, I'm hoping to take them from a place of ignorance to a place of awareness that, Hey, this matters. If what we're after is holistic health, then maybe not now, but at some point in your life, the fact that you rate contentment and peace disagree and the fact that you rate whole food plant-based strongly, strongly, strongly agree, you're eating a perfect diet, you're not content. Houston, we've got a problem. Like just that simple thing of calling it out. Because guess what? They're coming on to talk all about the thing that they're already good at. 
they want to know now, like, well, well, okay, I'm doing all this, but maybe I should do something more here. And they're still hyper-focused in taking a 99% healthy diet and trying to make it 99.9. Meanwhile, they're not content in life. Do we really think that getting it from 99 to 99.9 is going to be the clincher? No, there's something bigger going on. And they need, they need to, to acknowledge that in the first place. So, so I want to take them from a place of ignorance to a place of awareness. And then with that awareness, in hopefully a very kind way, like not like, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, it's more like, hey, this is an invitation. We're all in this together. I'm working on my clutter. I'm working on my, you know, emotional stress eating. Um, I'm working on my flexibility. This person's working on their, you know, their, uh, their movement and, and starting to move more. I mean, we're each working on our own things. So what are you going to do about it? And what's, what's one small step that you can take? You know, for that patient that I mentioned who is in a profound state of depression, the two things I left her with is one is you got to work on your thoughts that you're telling yourself and you got to stop accepting those as the truth and, and start to examine each thought and really ask yourself, is this, is this, is this true? Is this serving me? And is there a, a more hopeful message that I can start to be listening and paying attention to that can, that can help me? And then second is what's the next small step I can take that to get her out of her head and to actually get her in that land of doing and experiencing and being willing to, to mess up and fall flat and then get back up again and take action, right? And then, and then with that action is take, take some time for reflection after that. And if they go through that whole thing, then, hey, guess what? They're in a whole new level of awareness and then a new intention, new action, new reflection. This is the behavioral change cycle. With this way of going about it, I have self-compassion at the center of this all. In other words, as they do this, it's a very, you know, you're not, you're not critical of yourself. You're rather sort of viewing yourself as a work in progress. And so even if you mess up, that I really believe is a doorway and the opportunity for reflection and greater growth rather than trying to get focused so much on the outcome and getting it perfect, right? I think that as long as we can be in this area of making progress with each passing day, as opposed to why am I not this weight yesterday? You know, I, I see patients so that, that, that darn number on the scale, it carries so much power in how my patients think about themselves. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> hold on for a second. It is what it is. All right. Let's just take a step back, breathe and, and question, do I really want to let this number on the scale dictate my, my, my sense of identity and, and how good I'm going to feel about myself this day, rather than like, huh, I would have thought that eating this way I have been, it would have been lower, but it's not. Okay. All right. Not a reason to get angry. Let's just kind of reset and figure out what's going on and problem solve. Maybe, um, you know, I thought I could eat more nuts, but maybe I need to cut back on it. You know, it's just, just being, being like that a little more uh, holding yourself a little more lightly. Right. And so this is the behavioral change cycle. I try to um, encourage my patients to start to get on one where it's more of a journey as opposed to focusing on the outcome. And if I can get them doing this, then really, you know, it's, it, it has, as the first three responses to what, what do people think I try to bring for my patients? And, and it was hope, you know, I think that is to a large degree is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is a sense of hope. I usually tell patients, I can't promise you that the outcome that you're focused on is going to happen. But I do believe that if you're willing to just kind of get on the journey of each day, really trying to reach a greater state of overall health, that it is all going to work out, okay? And it may not be in the way that you think it is. You, you may not cure your diabetes. You may be, you know, maybe you will need insulin, but that is in and of itself is not the thing that is going to determine your identity or your success or your worth as a human being. And anyone who gives you that sense that if, if you don't obtain this total cholesterol, you know, no good. If you don't obtain this, well, no good. I think you need to sort of, you know, hold that at arm's length. Okay. 
Um, and I, I always like to share this quote. You can be both, this is from Sophia Bush, who's this, who's this American singer. You can be both a masterpiece and a work in progress simultaneously. You can be both a ma masterpiece and a work in progress simultaneously. I love that because so few people actually capture that, right? Really think about it, is that even at your current weight of whatever it may be, and even with your medications, and even with all the stuff you've got going on, you are a masterpiece. And yes, you've got some areas to work on. Yes, you can improve your, your diet dramatically. Yes, you can start to move more on a regular basis. Yes, the clutter in your house is too much. That's okay. You're aware of it. You're taking steps. And I know those seem like paradoxical, but I really believe they can both be true at the same time. And part of the journey is kind of learning and reminding yourself of that perspective in life that will allow you to hold that tension simultaneously and to not just think it, but to really truly believe it. Well, thank you very much for that very informative presentation, Dr. Lim. We are okay. now, we are now going to begin our Q and A. I'll, um, the, I'm sure we're gonna have plenty of uh, um, questions from the audience would be my guess. Um, and I have some questions too. We have about uh, 13 minutes. So um, before we do, if you have any uh, places that people can go to check out your, uh, you know, if you have a website or or social media so people can follow you, learn more about you. Yeah, I, uh, the vast majority of the work I do is through the McDougal program currently. It's, um, I've been medical director now eight years. I see all, all my consultations um, through them. You can arrange a new patient consultation and determine whether uh, maybe our 12-day program um, uh, is um, a good fit. Yep. And uh, we, we also have a free McDougal program. Um, and uh, in those consultations, I sort of assess pa pa patient suitability um, for the 12-day program. Um, I will just say one of the benefits that patients have appreciated of the 12 day program is because then they're a patient for life. And so every week, part of my schedule is seeing patients who have done the program as recently as one month ago to 20 years ago, <laughs> over 20 years ago for follow up. And what they say is that it's really hard to find medical doctors who you can trust these days. And so what, what I bring is a belief in the pillars and foundation of lifestyle medicine as the core, um, but then also open, I'm an MD, right? Open to the benefits of medicine as a secondary, medicines and surgery, as a secondary measure for when lifestyle has um, not fully helped a person. So, you know, it's, it's bringing both those worlds together rather than what patients feel, which is the reflex within the medical establishment to clean up the puddles while failing to address the root cause and turning off the faucet. So that's the best way to access me is through, is through the McDougal program. All right, great, thank you for that. So we're now gonna open up our live Q&A session. So um, I'll be asking questions if, you know, if there's not audience questions, I see one already. Um, and then we will, um, you know, and then we'll go from there. So real quickly, we'll be, uh, let's see here. Um, we don't take questions from the uh, from the chat directly. What we'll do is ask the audience to raise their hands in Zoom. To do that at the bottom right of Zoom, second to the right, actually, you'll see an icon called reactions. You'll click on that and then you'll select raise hand. Okay. And we will not, or excuse me, we will then take questions in the order in which we receive them. When it's your turn, I will unmute you prompt you to state your uh, where you're from and ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you in order to give everyone a chance. Um, we'll ask that you just ask a, a single question without follow-up. And if there is time, then you can go ahead and raise your hand again and get on the back of the line. And if we have time, we'll answer that as well. So I see we have a question from Wendy. So... Wendy, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hello, I'm calling in from uh, Boca Raton, Florida. It's so gorgeous Ooh. out here. Uh, my question is, so let's say you're trying to get rid of an addiction. For me, it's a coffee addiction. And I feel like you caught me. That coffee and vegan sweetener is like, mm. it's a real addiction. 
So you're trying to release something from your body and then it gets caught up in your bloodstream, recycles and makes you crave that very substance. So how do you break that um, cycle? Yeah, uh, so great question, Wendy, and gets to the heart uh, of a lot of the conversations I have with my patients. The very first thing is, what you've already shown that you're moving towards, which is awareness, right? You, you cannot cure or fix what you are not willing to acknowledge and accept. And it may seem sort of second nature that you've already acknowledged it, but for many, their ego, right, stands in the way. It is very hard for people to acknowledge what Carl Jung calls the shadow, and the shadow is that aspect of ourselves that doesn't like to be and that th those parts of ourselves that they are who part of who we are, but we don't want to acknowledge or accept it. And so we deny it and repress it. So you, the more that you can bring to light the truth of your dependencies on things like those vegan creamers and the coffee, that is gold. Okay. And, and so what I encourage you to do is now take that awareness and then start to notice also just kind of kind of sink in like, huh, I'm feeling that urge for that coffee with creamer. Like what, what am I experiencing? What's going on inside? What, what emotions am I feeling? And maybe who knows? I mean, this is kind of part of the process. You may notice that you're feeling whatever a sense, like I deserve it. I deserve a treat or I deserve something like some, some pleasure or something. And you just start to notice what the emotions are that arise. And then, and then really with that, with that awareness of the behavior, the habit, the emotions that are rising is starting to ask yourself, is there another way that I can meet this need of mine or these emotions of mine or this restlessness of mine or this stress or anxiety of mine in a way that does not involve this food, which I know to not be serving my long-term interest? That's, that's the, the core question. It's sort of replacing with something not that, that, that can meet that need. And so for example, um, I mean, there's so many, it, this is again, where the uniqueness of each person comes out. Um, I'll just give you some examples though. Uh, some people it's meditation. Uh, some people it's prayer, uh, for prayer is a huge one for, for people from whom spirituality, uh, going for a walk um, in, you know, ideally in nature. There's so much in terms of studies about the effect of nature in terms of stress coping, um, playing music or singing songs, talking to someone who you trust, um, uh, you know, journaling, my journal, right? Pages and pages. <laughs> this is, you know, where a lot of my thought, all of these, it has to be something that is aligned with the, the, the direction that you want to head in. Right. But that's kind of where it is, you know, it's awareness and it's sort of saying, setting an intention for a, a different kind of behavior that you're going to engage in when that craving comes up, right? And then it's actually putting it into action. And then it's reflecting on it, seeing, hey, how did that go? And maybe, you know, it doesn't work all the time, but over time, it starts to get better and better and better. And you find those set of behaviors that suit you uh, more and make you feel more whole. Great. Thank you, doctor. Our next question is coming from Bobby. Bobby, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Bobby and I live in Chicago. I'm happy to say that the weather is nice right now. <laughs> um, and I have just enjoyed your presentation so much. I really appreciate also at the beginning that you talk about uh, that it's a dietary journey. And I feel like I've definitely been on that. Um, and now I don't have sugar, salt, um, oil for the most part, flour. Um, and, but one thing that I'm working on is my blood pressure. So your, the transformation stories that you shared, super, super inspirational. And I'm hoping to eventually be free of blood pressure medication. Um, also, a couple of years ago when I was first diagnosed with high blood pressure, uh, the doctor did a Echo 2D Doppler um, test. I don't know what you call that, but mm -hmm. um, the left ventricle was normal in size, but there was moderate left ventricular hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, is that something that 
over time that can reduce, you know, like, can it go back to normal or is that something that is permanent usually? Um, I think that it's very possible that it could improve. Okay. Um, I think it's unlikely that your um, left ventricle, ventricular hypertrophy would, you know, basically return to its sort of original state. Um, but I, we know uh, from the studies that cardiac health can be improved, you know, the works of Dr. Ornish and, and Dr. Esselstyn and, and all the pioneers who have come before us. Um, but oftentimes in those studies, it's not that it, you know, it's not that old, age old plaques disappeared, right? There may have been some plaque reversal, but some of it was just so, so almost like scar tissue. And so I would say the goal is not in your mind, I would, I would sort of reframe the goal. The goal is not that I, you know, no longer have left ventricular hypertrophy, but the goal is that I make a, a significant enough change to the way I'm eating and my overall lifestyle that I can cure myself of high blood pressure because the high blood pressure is why you develop the left ventricular hypertrophy in the first place. And then by addressing it at that root cause level, now my heart's not going to have to be working as hard. The left ventricle is not going to become as, um, you know, hypertrophied, maybe it'll even relax a bit and uh, diminish in thickness a bit. And uh, I can rest easy in the fact that I'm doing everything I can to optimize my overall uh, cardiac health and minimize the likelihood of suffering a premature heart attack or stroke um, or other cardiovascular event in the future. And I think that's a, a realistic, very um, doable goal. Great. Thank you for that answer, doctor. So one quick question, because we just have a minute or so yep. left. Um, you mentioned cholesterol left uh, less than 150 is ideal. Um, we, we've had different doctors on thus far. Um, this morning, we had uh, Dr. Gabriel Cousins, who thinks that, uh, that the research shows that cholesterol should be higher for brain health. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you stand on, on, on that what is what is what does the research show with regard to cholesterol for heart and and then also cholesterol for uh, for mental functioning as well well i would be interested i mean if there's actually research that shows that higher cholesterol has led to better brain health i i have not i've not seen that study um and i will say that just in my experience and based on the research that i've seen that the people uh m most of the time who are eating the you know the a very clean whole food plant-based diet, what we see is dramatic drop in total cholesterol, um, oftentimes uh, down to uh, less than 150. But I'm also careful, uh, there, there's a small percentage of patients, I'd say like, you know, I don't know the exact number, but if I just had to roughly guess like, you know, 10% or less, who no, despite eating an optimal diet, um, uh, plant-based diet are still might have these high cholesterol levels. Um, and I, in their case, there's maybe genetic, I will say in all my years, I haven't had a single one of these end up having a cardiovascular event. And it's a reminder not to let any one thing become the end all be all right. Cardiac health is the composite of so many factors, including our BMI, our blood pressure, our blood sugar levels, our stress levels. Um, we even know that, uh, you know, how connected we are. Uh, impacts our cardiovascular health, or whether we have depression or not. So um, just kind of having that perspective that uh, I've told these patients, I've literally told some patients who have these high cholesterol levels years and years, and they're, they've made their whole life focus on this. I said, I think maybe you need to stop checking your cholesterol level. You know, you're, you're doing everything right. And it, everything else looks good. So I would start to let that, let, let that go. And that's brought them uh, great peace of mind. So I still generally subscribe that, you know, off medication, the lower you can, the better. Um, and I haven't seen research to suggest that you want, you actually want higher cholesterol levels for uh, brain health. Um, but that's just my experience. Okay, great. So with that, that concludes our Q and A, and we really appreciate all the information that you gave and your, and your perspective on holistic health. So real quickly, I'd like to give everybody in our audience the opportunity to share their appreciation with you. We're going to open up the mics and you're going to hear a whole cacophony yeah. of thanks. 
Yeah, there it is. Thank you, Dr. Lim. You're awesome. Love you. Love you. Great hike. Amazing. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, it's a little crazy. Yeah. All right. I'm very, I'm very filled by your love. Thank you. Thank you all. This was fun. This was fun. Mm -hmm.